This is going to blow your mind. A hydrogen technology that has a potential not only to be as good as, but most likely better and cheaper than the battery technology for electric vehicles and transportation in general. It showed so much promise in development that it was banned. Banned by the US government for a long period of time. The man behind this technology is going to be here in just a moment. And I will tell you how I discovered this technology. That's another interesting story on its own. And we're going to start right now. So the way that I and many of you found out about this technology was when my monthly guest Sandy Monroe and I were, well, playing dress up. I thought it'd be fun to make Sandy Toyota CEO for a day and see what he would do to compete with Tesla. And his answer blew my mind. And I wanted to give you a new job for a day. Um, I want to make you the new Toyota CEO for a day. And... You know, what if you wake up in Mr. Toyota's body tomorrow and you have to run? I, I, I know, I listen, I'm not, I didn't say it was an easy job. Oh, sorry, this, it's like this. Sorry. I, I, I'm not, I didn't say it was an easy job. No. Right? But, um, no. Okay, so, you know, you wake up as the CEO of Toyota tomorrow. You want to catch up to Tesla as the leader in the industry. There's a lot of work to do because they have been, you know, electrification deniers. Um, what do you do and when? Mm. Let's start with the batteries. Like, what do you do about well, the actually, battery? Well, actually, you know what? You know what? I'm I'm thinking about something else. So, Toyota went down the path of hydrogen, and um, and quite frankly, no one else did. Um, now they have the best fuel cell in the world, but the problem is that they have to have a hydrogen charge periodically. So, if I was in charge of Toyota, I would contact somebody called, a, a company called um, Plasma Kinetic. They, they have just uh, invented solid state hydrogen fueling. Yeah. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel by clicking that subscribe button and the bell notification icon because Sandy is our monthly guest plus you'll get to find out everything that's going on in the world of electric cars. So Sandy believes that with this technology, other automakers like Toyota can actually compete with someone like Tesla. And once I scraped myself off the floor after the initial shock, I contacted Plasma Kinetics and the man behind this technology, Paul Smith, is going to be here to tell us everything about it. But before that, of course, a quick reminder that this video is brought to you by the Volkswagen ID4 EV, which I am now a proud owner of. One of the cool features in my ID4 is the enhanced voice command system. I can do a lot of things in my car using my voice, including opening the shade of the beautiful panoramic optional roof without taking my hands off the wheel. See if you will love the ID4 as much as I do by exploring the link in the description of this video. All right, Paul, so I'm excited to have you here and I gotta get something out of the way before we get into the actual technology. I know this was essentially banned by our US government. Tell me a little bit about that, why, and what is the, what is the update on it right now? When we introduced this technology in 2008, the U.S. government said it was just initially, they said it was transformational. Shortly thereafter, they changed the title to disruptive. It, the, the uh, energy as a source of um, national security is one of the under the falls under the umbrella of national security. And the recognition that technology was disruptive caused them to say, wait, we got to slow this down. So they restricted our patents. We weren't able to be provided the patents until 2017. But since 2017, we've been allowed to commercialize the technology. The only restrictions we remain under are that we're under ITAR, International Trade and Arms Regulations, for the ability to export it for missile fuel. So it's not an exportable as missile fuel, but otherwise it's ready to go. Wow. So it was too good to be out there. Wow, that is yes. that is awesome. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, so let's dive into this because I think most of the people watching right now just know about the uh, hydrogen technology as it is in Mirai, Toyota Mirai and so forth. Yes. Tell me a little bit about how does this work and how is it different from that technology that we know right now? 
Well, my background's in computer chip manufacturing. So I approached it from that aspect because in a computer chip, you're trying to layer up materials and get the conductivity the way you want it, get the molecules oriented in the position you want them. So what we do with our technology is we layer up materials that's going to conduct light through the material and cause a, what we call a dielectric. It just means that when you put it in a wave, like an electromagnetic wave or magnetic wave, it's going to change the orientation of the bonds. That's how we can absorb it so easily. It's just a whole bunch of negative charged material waiting to grab a hydrogen. And when you shine a light on it, it becomes a positively charged material and releases the hydrogen. All right. Well, yeah, so it, and how is it different from how it's done today? Today, they take hydrogen and it's a natural form, if you will, in its H2 format, and they compress it. They compress it under large amounts of pressure. Initially, in the middle of the 1910 to 1915, or I'm sorry, <laughs> 2010 to 2015, we we're actually looking at uh, compressing to 5,000 PSI, which is quite a lot of pressure. But recently, in the case of the Mirai, they've gone to 7, 000, uh, yeah, 10,000 PSI, 700 bar. I try tongue twat twist because I'm twist, because I'm always talking in terms of kilograms and bar. But in the case of PSI, it's 10,000 PSI for a hydrogen tank. And the Mirai holds five and a half kilograms of hydrogen um, at that pressure. All right. So, I so let's let's talk about the specifics here because. You know, when I was talking to Sandy uh, Monroe, when we kind of discovered you guys, you know, he essentially made it sound like, you know, there are basically discs there that uh, that you would put in your car and they would get sort of used up and then you swap them for the new ones. So uh, how close to the truth this is? Uh, and I know you guys were in the middle of development uh, before you had to stop. But, you know, if this was to be developed to the point where, you know, another two or three years where it is acceptable commercially, um, tell me about these discs. How how big are they going to be? How heavy? How many miles can we get out of them? Tell me, tell me everything. Okay. Well, we have several ways of, of creating this material. As I mentioned, it's just like a computer chip, but it's very very thin. It's so thin that it can sit on a on a CD, or it can also be put as a film. So it can be like a movie film. And in fact, if you think of a movie film that's rolling reel to reel and a light shining on it. That light, when it shines in that film, if it's holding hydrogen, is going to release it. And that's how our technology works. The same was true with the laser disc player. The laser shining on the disc releases the hydrogen. So we did our initial technology was with the disc. We were happy to use disc because disc provided us the opportunity to say, look, it's a laser. You're familiar with a laser. It's going to release hydrogen just the way music is released from your CD. So now we're moved to the film because it's a little bit easier to manage. We can carry much larger amounts at a lighter weight. So because we can make the film, film very thin, so we can make it thin and that makes, and what it sits on is thin, so it gets very light. We're now using a nano graphite film, which is um, thinner once it's one tenth the thickness of a human hair. And that's what all the substrate or the, all the material rather is sitting on, which is also just the thickness of a human hair. So Putting that on a CD, you only have so much surface area, but putting it on film, you have miles and miles of it. Okay, now tell me how big would one disc be or my, one module and how many you know miles you would be able to get out of it once this technology is developed? Well, we are actually very close to looking at hydrogen. So when we look at hydrogen at the 5,000 PSI, we have the same weight as that and this and size. That weight and size is being looked at for trucks and it's the chosen standard in India. So in India, they're compressing the hydrogen to 5,000 PSI. We don't need the compression, which means that if you're a wind farm or solar farm and you, need to, you want to store energy and you wanna provide it for transportation, or you wanna just use it so that when it's nighttime, you can return it to the grid, you can store the material in our material, in our material, you store the hydrogen in our material at the same size and weight as you would a three, a, well, it's 300 bar, but that's a, a, a 5,000 PSI tank. So we offer that and it's less expensive. We're less expensive than the carbon fiber tanks that you store and transport hydrogen. Even the Mirai tank is a carbon fiber tank that we're less expensive than. So commercialization is very easy. The wind and solar farm doesn't need to compress the hydrogen. They're now able to save all the costs of the compressors, save the risk of a flammable um, gas on site, 
Instead, they simply provide the hydrogen into our material, into our film. It soaks it up and then they can ship it or they can shine a lighter on it in the evening and it'll return hydrogen and not, not as much as it was signing during the day, the solar panels, obviously, but just trying to light on it, it releases the hydrogen back to the electro, to a, what we would then have a fuel cell that it's going to then provide the hydrogen, the energy back to the. Okay. So I, I guess I'm trying to more steer you in terms of like how many pounds, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, if I have to buy this disc, will I be able to drag it home? Will I be able to insert it in the car? You know, how, how many pounds would it be and how many, how many miles I can get out of each? Well, it's an easy answer in the sense that it's a 15 pounds is 20 miles. So that's not uh, particularly light. It's three bags of sugar that'll get you 20 miles. But on the other hand, we don't anticipate that you'll actually have to be lifting them and carrying them. Um, Stacy, our CEO, is working on designs for an automated piece that will simply take the discs out of your car and put new ones in. So you don't have to think about it and it's going to work just fine. The um, weight for trucks is a different thing where you actually use cylinders rather than little cassettes. Those cylinders are at 370 pounds, but four of those let a truck go uh, 570 miles. Wow, so essentially it's like having your own little battery swap at, uh, in your garage where you can still buy this and, and, and bring in, okay, all right. Exactly, if you need extra, if you're going on a long trip and don't wanna stop, you can put them in your trunk and bring extra along and swap them out as you, as you need. Or somebody so can they're, drive they're it by too. All right, that's that sounds good. Now, but if we're talking about like you know maybe five or ten years down the road, is it possible to make the discs? I'm assuming lighter, smaller, with more miles, right? Anything is possible, and we anticipate that that's quite uh, likely. That the research in our the research we've brought brought about so far has advanced it so far. We're much lighter already and much smaller, and we're moving constantly in that direction. So looking down the road, I anticipate a much lighter um, application that, in fact, we're already seeing a significant interest from aircraft as well, that because we're light enough now that aircraft manufacturers are looking at the technology. So it won't be long before we actually can offer that. Now we compared it to the uh, current hydrogen fuel cell technology, but how would it compare to the um, battery powered vehicles and, and, and battery technology, even if we take into account the 4680 technology that Tesla just came out with, um, is it able to compete with that or maybe even beat that? Batteries are extremely efficient um, from the standpoint of they store the energy just as they're going to use it. You don't have a conversion cost or anything. However, our technology has some unique advantages over batteries. One is that it's far lighter. Um, it actually does, weighs less than a third the weight of a battery for the same amount of energy. The, that's that in its and it's smaller. So for the same size of that battery, we have a smaller size. The cost is far less. We are only in the range of 20% the cost of a battery. So we're less expensive, we're smaller, we're lighter. So it lo looks like a good fit. The drawback is you can't just plug the system into an electric grid and charge it. You've got to do a conversion uh, to hydrogen, store the hydrogen, and then convert the hydrogen back to electricity. So on the two ends of our system are an electrolyzer that turns water into hydrogen and a fuel cell, which is going to take the hydrogen, turn it back into electricity. And those two pieces on either end are getting better and better. They were expensive. They were not long lasting, but each, they were making great miles, great strides in the direction of having more reliable, more efficient and smaller and lighter fuel cells and electrolyzers. The electrolyzer, um, we just spoke with a company who has now a 30, is are offering a 35 year warranty on their electrolyzer. It's a new technology that's unheard of. Usually the anode and cathode wear out. In this case, it's gonna last 35 years. And by the way, what happens to those discs once, once they used up? Uh, can, it, can they be recharged uh, or they have to be kind of thrown away? Is there a way to recycle them? Tell me a little bit about the byproduct. Actually, it's quite interesting. We are able to recycle 100%, but they are reusable over 100 times, as much as 150 times. And actually an interesting aspect of it is the reason that we don't go past 150 times is we start to get contaminated with additional hydrogen in the sense of deuterium starts to build up. So we store protium and deuterium, the two isotopes, common isotopes of hydrogen, the protium being far more um, available. The deuterium though is very small amount starts to build up because our light when it shines on the material doesn't release that. So we let it build up 
until we drop to about 98% of the usability of the film, and then we're gonna recycle it. When we recycle it, we actually um, get a benefit in that we can recover that deuterium, which is a saleable commodity. So we sell the deuterium, that covers all the costs of the recycling, so we can return the canister to service at no additional cost. So that means you don't, if you're an OEM and you bought a canister for your truck or a, for your automobile that you're selling with your automobile, you don't have to worry that the customer is going to have to go buy another one. They'll get another one at no cost, but they'll just pay for the hydrogen. And the hydrogen will be far less expensive than hydrogen that's compressed or liquefied because compressed hydrogen at 10,000 PSI is fairly expensive. It's twice as expensive as our hydrogen would be coming from solar and wind farms where it isn't compressed. I'm also assuming that if you can swap this disks at home, you can also build you know, um, a swapping station network as well for people who want to travel, especially, especially for far remote uh, uh, spots, right? It, it wouldn't take any more sort of effort or energy to kind of sprinkle them around the, the area? No, and, and the cost is dramatically less. We envision a 20 foot container can hold enough to do many, many charges. So if you have you need a gas station, instead of a two and a half million to $3 million hydrogen fueling station, you can now spend $200,000 to have a containers that are filled with the cassettes or the canisters to load into your vehicle. So it's a fraction of the cost you simply stop by, drop off your old ones, pick up new ones. Here we have the blue rhino system for those who are familiar with propane tanks. You brought a propane tank with your grill, but you don't necessarily use it. You take it empty to where you're going to the blue rhino. You just drop it off and pick up another one. And you don't care that you didn't get the original can or can that came with you. You're happy to buy the fuel. That's the way we envision our technology works. And it's so inexpensive in that regard and so comfortable that just like blue rhino can put a Outside any convenience store, they can put a rack of propane tanks. We can do the same with our cassettes. So you can envision that they can be spread far and wide with relatively low cost, no need for piping, no need for expensive trucking of expensive fuel. And we can also be close to our source. So if there's a solar or wind farm near you, we don't have to transport it many miles from, another, from far away. We can just capture the energy right there. And we should also mention we don't need just wind or solar. We can capture it from steam methane reformation. We can capture hydrogen from even from blue gases and from even wastewater treatment facilities. So we have a distributed source for our hydrogen because we don't require any cost to absorb it. And that makes it easy to distribute to consumers. Interesting. Now, let's just talk really quickly about manufacturing the actual vehicles that will use this technology. Is it easier, a less expensive, or comparable to uh, what, what it costs and, uh, right now to make the electric vehicles that are battery powered? Uh, use, uh, battery powered, we are far less expensive. There is an additional, um, there's a lot of modifications that are needed, needed, but they're all very doable. For instance, the cooling system for the batteries gets becomes a cooling system for the fuel cell. And the cooling system and the other uh, components, all the electronic components, the motors, they all work the same. No problem there, but you're taking out a very heavy battery and replacing it with a two components, a fuel cell and our system. And our system, including with the lasers, is lighter than the battery significantly. So you're going to get better mileage and a longer distance. And doing that is going to be straightforward. It's still your electric vehicle. It's just charges by swapping out a cassette rather than plugging it in. On the So that's basically, I hope that answered the question there. Yeah, yeah, no, this this sounds great. Now, tell me where you guys are at. I know you had to fight the government and uh, over and over again, you finally got, got you know, a, a, an ability to to move forward. Um, where are you guys at right now in, in terms of development and where where what's your plan for the next, you know, few years? We have um, been very much um, being sought after by a lot of com companies and countries. So, and thank you very much for your support of the technology. We have recently received hundreds of requests to offer of offers to support us or letters of information requests. So we're very excited that it's taking hold. In the United States, we haven't seen it as our primary source of interest. The primary source of interest are coming from Asia and Europe. There are much stronger mandates in Asia and Europe for getting to clean fuel faster. And as a result, we're seeing a tremendous amount of interest in those markets. However, we're very much 
interested in being a global market, particularly since we're based in the US, we wanna start in the US, we wanna do the best job we can in the US first. So we envision right now that we're gonna be starting our facilities um, in Arizona is where we believe we're going to be. Um, we're still in investigating other locations inside the US as well as outside the US because some of our cus potential customers, I should say, have asked that we have locations worldwide. So we're already at the point where the, the requests are outstripped what we can do in a single production facility. And so we're going to be producing facilities in the U.S. shortly that are going to be on the scale of, um, in their, compared to computer chip manufacturing, they're very inexpensive. At $100 million, it's far, a fraction of the cost of a billion-dollar chip manufacturing plant. Well, listen, this is a fascinating story. I was blown away when Sandy told me about it. And when we had this conversation, even before the taping, uh, I'm, I'm definitely uh, rooting for you guys. Any new technology that can make our cars better is always welcomed. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you, you'll, you'll come back with some more news in the next you know, year or so. We're excited to be sharing with you today. And we're sure we'll be even more excited a year from now. So looking forward to it. I will definitely keep my eye on this technology. And if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comment section of this video. So next time Paul is here, we'll hopefully be able to answer them. Well, my mind is blown. Let me know your thoughts on this. And don't forget to subscribe because Sandy Monroe is actually going to be back on this channel next week. And I'm sure Paul will be back at some point soon as well. All right. Looking forward to all of your comments. Other than that, see you guys next time. And remember to stay charged.